Number 451. The greatest sin, the Master used to say, is to call yourself a sinner. You are a child of God. Though gold be covered with mud for centuries, it remains gold. Oh, oh. So, the, so the pure gold of your soul... Excuse me. <laughs> I just had two pages were stuck together. Though gold be covered with mud for centuries, it remains gold. So the pure gold of the soul can be covered over with the mud of delusion for eons. But in its true nature, it remains forever undefiled. Oh, it's such a beautiful promise. We'll talk about that in just a moment. I was laughing. I mean, you see me in this corner, and many of you I know who are local or even across the world have visited the Palo Alto community and been through this house where I've been living for the last 12 years, actually, now. It's a community house, but I have a bedroom here. And periodically I have long-term guests, and periodically I have housemates. Master said we should start spiritual communities in which we would have home, job, and church in one place. <laughs> Coming downstairs for the last two weeks, I guess, let's see, our county went into shelter in place really early, so we're in, we're in our third week now. He, it went in on like Friday or Saturday of two weeks plus now. And the truth is I spend a lot of time in this house anyway. I tend to move between here and the church, but, you know, I, I used to, like everyone else, in the very recent past. It's amazing how this, this is being recorded the very end of March 2020, just to give it historical context, uh, you know, a few months into this coronavirus-19, COVID virus, corona, COVID-19, coronavirus. Um, now, it all seems really long ago, but anyway, I used to go to restaurants. <laughs> I used to go grocery shopping, you know, just all the things that people do. But for me personally, because I, uh, I spend a lot of time in this house anyway, have always events come into this house, and I don't always have to go out and find them. But now the, we, have two, we, we have two recording, broadcasting is the word I keep using. I don't know if broadcasting is actually the right word for what we're doing, but that's how it feels to me. We're casting our thoughts abroad. So we're broadcasting both from the living room of this house and also from our church. And so occasionally I go to the church, but mostly everything just happens right here. In fact, it's a far more social life, I think, than I normally live because we're broadcasting several times a day. And so uh, the, there's a, a very small, quite protected team that comes in and out. We're functioning almost like a family group, you know, just a, a, a restricted group of people who have very little contact with anyone but each other. It's all pretty well controlled. But the end of it is I realize that I have a home job and church in one place. <laughs> and, and my home is here, my job is here, and my church is here, and I just keep coming in and out of this room. And it, it, what, 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 what I was struck by is that it feels like an enormous world. Uh, all of you have seen the same cartoons that I've been seeing because of Facebook. The whole world sees the same cartoons. And one of the ones was there was a, a picture, maybe I've said this to somebody, there was a picture of the house plan, the, the, the floor plan, like a, an architect's little floor plan of a one-bedroom apartment, bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, living room, like this balcony. And, and the caption was, making travel plans for the weekend. <laughs> and the other one I heard was the husband comes home and says, and doesn't come home, the husband says to his wife, where shall we go for dinner tonight? The living room, the bedroom? And she says, it's just too much responsibility having to make all these decisions for the family. So all of us are just living in a, an odd way. But what, struck, what has struck me about this experience is that it feels exceedingly expanded. And it's, it's an odd sort of feeling. I guess I'm a person who's spent, especially in the last few years, I've spent months in seclusion. And just sort of... But in the seclusion, I was writing, so I was also uh, way out there in my consciousness, even though my body's life was restricted. And, and because we've been broadcasting so much, I'm on at nine in the morning most mornings, not every, but most mornings. And now we're adding a 12 noon, which is a Monday through Friday broadcast, plus 
the Tuesday night class plus occasional Saturday classes. And so I feel like, even though I feel like I'm really uh, connected to a lot of people in it, it, I was just re- I was just sort of realizing all of this this evening, just as I was coming downstairs, r- realizing that I I'm downstairs and I'm upstairs and then I'm upstairs and then I'm downstairs, and I also, because I know how to sew and because we have a whole community here, I and a few others have taken on this project of making a lot of homemade uh, protective masks. So sometimes I go about ten feet away from where I'm sitting, to where I have this huge chaotic sewing table up, and I'm madly making masks for people and then sending them out. But all of it feels really big. And I don't know whether, I don't know where that bigness is coming from. That was what I was trying to reflect on. I know it's coming from my own heart because it's an internal feeling. Uh, Another uh, pair of friends of mine Actually, uh, Narayani and Shurjo, many of you are listening from India, so you know them. Shurjo is an Indian man. Narayani is his wife. She's Spanish. Narayani, the two of them were with Swami in the last years of his life. She was his caregiver for the last year. She wrote, just by the way, do I have a copy I can hold up for you? She wrote this. Could you even hand me one of her her books? I'm just going to do some blatant. I'm not quite sure how you get this book. If you can't figure out how to get it, then write to me because I have copies or I'll get it to you. My heart remembers. This is an absolutely beautiful book about Narayani's uh, relationship with Swamiji in the last years of his life. Um, but when, I, when we talked on Skype, which all of us are talking with each other all over the world, they both indicated to me, now, uh, they're both uh, millennials, people, they're, they're, they're rising into the really expansive, productive period of their lives. I'm, you know, I, I intend to stay busy till the end, but I've already done a lot. Um, and they really feel like this, this kind of a challenge, whether this is actually going to be a, a line in the sand in which the global everything changes, or whether this will just be a blip on the horizon. But they were born to serve Master's work, and they were born for rising Dwapara. And they were t- talking to me about the same thing that I've been feeling, which is on one hand there's anxiety and serious concern, like where are we going, what's going to happen, uh, how long will this last, what will happen to the economy. I mean, everybody has a long list. Fortunately, I'm not going stir-crazy. Some people are actually thinking, how will I survive? And I don't, I don't mean just being hungry but just how will I survive in my one-bedroom apartment? Um, Which, thank you, God, is not my issue. But there's a lot of uncertainty. But I've also had this intermittent feeling of... um, Well, the word exaltation is the word that comes to me. I'm not even quite sure why that's the word. But this feeling of, of enormous energy... Of a, of a benign and loving kind. Um, in the Bible, Jesus never speaks of the feminine form of God because in the context of his incarnation, with the message that he brought to the Jewish people, he was trying to move them from the stern ju- God is the stern judge to God is the loving father and to take them all the way to God the mother. Just It wasn't his mission. That's what Yogananda has done. Yogananda came to America and has brought um, the idea of Divine Mother. That's a whole beautiful and interesting thing to contemplate because it's not only... Tonight's just going to be a little chat-chat. You can see that. Um, I I was actually walking down the stairs thinking, I just feel like talking to people tonight. (laughs) I will go back to the book because it is important. But I just felt I had a lot of things I wanted to say. But it's, it's fascinating when you think See, every master has the same state of consciousness. It's not like Jesus didn't know what Yogananda knows, or Yogananda doesn't know what Buddha knows, or Buddha didn't know what Chaitanya knows, or Ramakrishna didn't know what Krishna knows. They all have exactly the same perspective. But standing in that state of perfect realization, um, they have no karma of their own, and they have no 
they have absolutely nothing that compels them personally. They, the entire reason, reason that they incarnate at all, that they take a physical, physical body, is to serve the world, whatever world they incarnate in. They're there to serve it. And the message that they deliver, the, the, what would you put it, the particular um, facet of the, of the infinite that they choose to emphasize is determined by the age, the yuga of the planet in which they've chosen to incarnate, which defines the cultural and the overall consciousness and the circumstances in which they live. And it's also determined by the karma of the disciples they come to serve. And so, and the mission of an avatar is always twofold. It's it's a world-changing reality. That's one of the characteristics of an avatar. An avatar is not greater spiritually than any other realized being. Uh, Swami writes in, in various places that Jivan Mukta is a fully realized being in terms of his experience of the infinite. But he doesn't, he doesn't have the... Well, I'm, I'm beyond myself, so I'm not even going to finish that sentence. I can't finish that sentence. But the avatar returning from a state of absolute realization always has a mission that really affects the world. They have an impact on the world. That's what I'm trying to say. So the avatar has two parallel tracks that they're running. One is whatever assignment they have, what, why, why they were drawn to the planet, and then whatever they owe to their disciples and how they have to carry it out for their disciples. And so the context, like Jesus was an avatar for the Jewish people, uh, Judaism is, is a true religion, it's Sanatan Dharma, it had fallen a bit on hard times with a very corrupt priesthood. There was a true remnant, which was the Essenes, and the power of that sincerity drew Jesus. And then Jesus was there to advance the understanding of spirituality from the harsh judge um, to the Father. So what I was going to say about all that is, that's also the progress of our own soul. And this is just this is a way diversion, but I wanted to finish it. Which is we start by being a little bit afraid of God, and he lays, has to lay down the rules. We don't quite know what we're supposed to be doing. And so we have to find out, well, what am I supposed to do here? So the Ten Commandments come down. You know, it's perfectly clear, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do, and I need to adhere to this. And then we sort of like, what will happen to me if I don't? And how will I know what's right? So then the concept of the, of the law and the judge comes in, that I, I sort of have this, this clear-cut path that I can walk. And you see, many people are very sincere spiritually, but they need a really clear-cut path to walk. You know, they just have to know what's accepted and what's not accepted, what's the consequences of falling off, and that clarity holds them to it. But, but living in fear of punishment and being good because of the, the bad things that will happen to you if you're not, is not quite the same as doing it spontaneously because it arises from you. And it also, it's kind of a harsh idea of God. So Jesus said, the Father, if you ask of your Father a loaf of bread, will he give you a stone? That's what Jesus said. Of course he won't. Your Father loves you. So then we begin to realize that the Father loves us, that God is not our judge. God is our Father. Now, the masculine, though, is still a little bit impersonal. And, I mean, it's traditional, kind of a, a joke in families, not necessarily true. Wait till your father gets home and I tell him what you did. You know, like the father is the disciplinarian. It's a, it's a stereotype that isn't even necessarily true, but that's sort of the, the joke. The mother is there all day, and then when daddy comes home is when you really get in trouble. So there's still that thought that the father is, demands of me, and I have to meet the standard. And that's, that's appropriate, because we do. <laughs> the father does demand of us, and we have to meet the standard, because it, that's how spiritual life works. We have, to, we have to exercise our own will. But the mother, and this is where I started, the mother, when Jesus talked about the mother, he, he called the mother the comforter. Because what we're really talking about is we're talking about the universal realities of yin and yang, of masculine and feminine, of receptive and outgoing. Um, just these are the, 
the substance of what the universe is made of. So God lays down the law. We are judged for what we do. That's the law of karma. Not We're not judged unfairly, but we're measured. We're weighed and measured. The Father demands a certain that we rise to meet the challenge, but the Mother just comforts us. And that's what, that's what Master's essential message was, is that God is the comforter. And we have nothing to fear. We have absolutely nothing to fear. I mean, even the worst murderer is still loved by his mother. It's just the way the mother is made. And the human mother is just this very pale imitation of this glorious divine mother that is always taking care of us. Now, actually, coming into what we're reading here, the greatest sin the Master said is to call yourself a sinner. You are a child of God. Now, there's two words for disciples. There's two Sanskrit words for disciples. One is, um, well, no, I, I, I'm, I don't want to go to Sanskrit. I mean, there's two words that way you can speak about disciples. We use the word disciple in English, and the obvious origin point of that is discipline, which is not untrue. I mean, I, I, I've said that about 30 times in this brief minutes that I've been talking that we don't just sort of drift our way into cosmic consciousness. It takes every ounce of our strength and our willpower to be able to do it. It's not a hardship, however, to put out that energy, but we do have to put out that energy. Thus, to be a disciple is to follow the discipline, the discipline that the Guru lays down for us for our own salvation. You see, the point is it's not a punishment. And nor does he ask of us more than we are willing to freely give on our own. I mean, that's, that's the whole point about discipleship, is that it cannot be imposed upon us. Lesser teachers may try to overcome you with their willpower, but a true master can only magnetize you with his love, and he can only magnetize us to the extent that we ourselves uh, open the doorway. Receive is the word. If we receive that love, then we're drawn to it. But if we close ourselves off to it, nothing much happens because the guru simply radiates. He doesn't impose. Um, so that's a really beautiful part of it. But the discipline that, that the word disciple means is that we have to discipline our our, our disinclination for spiritual growth. You know, there's a part of us that continues to imagine that that less effort is better. And so we have to work with that. It's just a reality. But the other word for disciple is chela. And the origin of the word chela is child. This house where I'm speaking to you from, which is the community house in our community, is called Chela Bhavan. Bhavan means house, house of the disciples. When this house became the community house about 12 years ago, we had to think about how could we characterize it so that everyone would understand it belongs to the disciples, it's ours. It's the house of the, of the Guru's children. And when we think of ourselves as Chelas, we use the word disciple a lot more because it's English. But the word chela is really the, the sweetest uh, way for us to think about ourselves. You're not a sinner. You're a child of God. That doesn't mean we don't sin. That's important to understand because we may. We often do. Sin is, sin is not... Oh, well, you know, the word has all this connotation, you know, like you're damned forever because you're just a sinner. Sin is just, oh, I started to say the word stupidity. A nicer word is like ignorance. Sin is ignorance. Out of ignorance, we do something that is not in our best interest. And the only thing that makes it a sin is that we are violating, we're sinning against ourselves. We're not sinning against God. We're, we're doing something ignorant that will rebound upon us and cause us to have less of what God wants to give us. 
So that's all it means. You have to realize Divine Mother, the Guru, Heavenly Father, however you want to think of it, and uh, Jesus, which is a wonderful way to think about it. Jesus, I mean, uh, Christianity is a beautiful guru-oriented religion. Oddly, they haven't yet, traditional, haven't quite recognized that, that it has much more in common with Sanatana Dharma and the Eastern approach than it does with anything else. But they have, I mean, the, the infinite itself, of course, is untouched by any um, turbulence on the surface of the ocean. But the guru himself also is completely untouched because there's no self there to be affected. There's just, it's a pure window that, that has a shape and a form that allows us to relate more understandably to the power of the infinite behind it. But nothing that we do in any way tarnishes or affects the guru or tarnishes or affects the infinite spirit. How could the infinite spirit be in any way hurt by the little fluctuations on the surface of the ocean? The infinite spirit is the entire ocean. So these little drops are being turbulent here, but the entire ocean is just always what it is. It's, it's never changed, no, how many, no matter how many waves blow across it. It just is what it is. <clears throat> so when we, people talk about sinning against God, we're not sinning against anything outside of ourselves. We're just behaving in a way that eventually will appear to have been unwise to us because we suffer. People we love will suffer if... if They'll suffer on our behalf, <coughs> or they'll, they may suffer because of our <coughs> insensitivity to them. But mostly it's we ourselves who suffer, because we set up dissonance. It's mud. It's just what it is. You know, the, the, the image of the power of gold to be untouched, is, it's, it's so magnificent. I have these gold rings that I wear this emerald ring has, you know, quite a bit of gold in it because the emerald itself required it. And I, sometimes I look at this gold and I don't know where this gold has been. I don't know where this emerald has been. You know, it's had all these experiences conceivably before it ever got to me. But now I wear it and I wear it for a time and who knows what will happen. And if I were to lose this ring, which once it did fall off, um, it broke actually, but now it's solid as a rock and it won't again. It actually fell off, oddly. I was swimming in a swimming pool, and then all of a sudden I just watched it float off my hand. And I thought, oh my gosh, thank you, God, if it had just floated off. We were experimenting with a certain design which was ill-advised, and it wasn't strong enough for the stone. But I just watched it fall, and I thought, oh, I did, I did retrieve it, but I thought, oh my, that could easy, so easily happen. Friends of mine have lost their, you know, we also have these astrological bangles. Sometimes you just get lost in very peculiar circumstances. A friend of ours here had an accident on a, what do we call those people mover things? They have a better word for it now. The things where you kind of just think and it moves. Yeah, whatever you call it. But he fell and he wasn't badly hurt, but in the fall he lost his bangle and he never found it again. And another friend of mine got... uh, in the the kayak kayak she was in, I think, turned over and she got tumbled about in the river. It was a bit of a scary moment, but she came up fine, but her bangle came off. And and no idea how. And in both cases, I think the bangle was sacrificed. It's like these are protective devices and they were sacrificed so the person could be spared. But what I'm saying is, this gold could have been so many things. Or if I had happened to have lost it on a mountain trail or something like that and never found it again, it could have sat there, literally, for centuries until something happened and they turned it up. And then there it would have been. And somebody could have just purified it, as my goldsmith friend did. She got this in some form or another. I don't even know what it was. I might have myself given her a few other pieces of gold. She melts it, she changes it, there it is. But, you know, there's just this quality to it. It's just unmistakable. 
real gold looks like real gold. It always does. If you have an eye for it at all, you can always tell what is imitation and what is not. That's us. I mean, that my whole long story about all of that, because that's us. For those who have eyes to see, I was just saying, those who have eyes to see can tell real gold from not real gold. I'm no expert, but just glancing at things I can usually see because I've looked at enough. But that's us. No matter what happens to it, that's who we are. That is so extraordinary to contemplate. And there's so much freedom in that. I'm a little covered with mud, and some of that mud may take a little bit. Some of that has dried on and it's gotten pretty thick. It's going to take a strong hose to knock it off, or I may have to even chip it off. But it's not me. It's just this, this stuff that's adhered to me because of my dumb decisions. You know, my seem like a good idea at the time decisions. My sins, which was my ignorance. But that's not who I am. You see how, how just very different than that? I was remembering for some reason, oh, it was because I was talking about this, um, Keshava and Sai Ganesh and, and Lakshmi, Suryani, a few others, and these are just friends who live in this community, were part of this small team that is sort of moving in and out of this house very carefully. And they're all being the, the techies, the engineers for these websites. Uh, websites web things, web webinars, that's the word I'm looking for. Broadcast is the word, word I like. Um, and it occurred to me, seeing Keshava for the third time today, realizing that they have to listen to me talk a lot. And, and they have to listen to me talk in a situation where it's harder for them to mask their boredom if they're feeling it, <laughs> because it's just the two of us most of the time, whoever the two are. So I was commiserating with him. Poor sap. Either you're getting to a, a lot of austerity. Um, I hopefully it's not too hard for you, but even if it is, you're getting to do a lot of austerity, so you get a lot of good karma. So either way, he's okay. He's either being entertained, they are either being entertained, or they're earning good karma through tapasya. Tapasya is austerity. But what I was remembering, and you know, I'm as uh, I'm as insecure and defensive as the next, and I used to be a lot more insecure and defensive. After enough time passes, we kind of mellow out a little bit, and I have mellowed. But when I was first early living here in Palo Alto, which is, I moved here, I lived in, at Ananda Village from 1971 through 1986. That was my first 15 years. I call that my childhood, my spiritual childhood. I grew up essentially in Swami's house. I had my own house, I didn't live there, but his house was my house. And he's my spiritual father, and that was my childhood. I tell people I grew up at Ananda, but grew up was my 20s and 30s. That was when I became a functioning person. Um, 1987, Master's birthday, I came to live in Palo Alto, and I've been here ever since. Now the point was, oh yes. And at the beginning, there was, a, there was an established Ananda group here. It had been here since 1981. And some great souls had done some very good work to get it started. And then when we took it over, we just sort of have worked with it continuously for all these decades. And at the beginning, especially, I, I was really the, the mouthpiece. I, I taught. We had, we had more staff. We had other teachers. But I did a huge amount of the teaching and the Sunday services. And I taught most of the meditation classes. I just was a... It was fun, and I, I talked all the time. And this man, who's a very, who is and was, was then and is now, is a very dear friend, um, felt he, he had to come and talk to me. And I don't know if he felt he had to be sincere with me or if it just seemed like a good idea at the time. But he sat down across from me and he said, I know many people find you inspiring, he said, but I don't. <laughs> and fortunately, just by the grace of God, the first thought that popped into my mind was not, you know, how dare you say such a thing to me or bursting into tears. I said, oh, you poor man. You're here all the time. It must be terrible for you. <laughs> and 
<laughs> he was so shocked. All I could think of was you poor soul because he was an integral staff person. He had to come to every event. So hours and hours of his life, he had to listen to me talk. <laughs> My response so disarmed him that we, you know, I don't even remember what happened after that. He, there was no place for him to go. There was nothing he could do, so there was no problem to solve. I just felt real sorry for him, and I think we just commiserated for a while. He never mentioned it again. Well, right, right near that time, Divine Mother was just having so much fun with me. Right near that time, another man came to <laughs> forgive me. The funniest things happened, you know. When these things happen to you, and you just realize that people just do the damnedest things, <laughs> then when you're on the giving end of it, you know, and you do something that just seemed like a good idea, but then somehow you wake up, whether you wake up in an hour or you wake up in, in 25 years, and you think, what could I have been thinking? You can remember when it happened to you and hope that everybody has a good sense of humor. So this man comes and he sits with me and he says, um, you know, you can inspire people to a certain point, but after that there's really not much you can do with them. <laughs> and once again, it was just like, and I said, yeah. It's like, I said, fortunately, we have Swamiji, we have Master. You're absolutely right. If you were depending on me, you would really be in trouble. And then he, he that wasn't enough for him, though. He just said some other things, the exact words don't stick in my mind, basically about how incompetent I was. But once again, by the grace of God, all I said to him was, do you think if I knew how to do this job, I would still be doing it? It's like, of course I don't know how to do it. If I had mastered it, Swami at least, and certainly God himself would have moved me on to my next level of incompetence. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Like, once you master something, why would you just keep repeating it? I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what a lot of people do. They try to find the place where they are no longer threatened, and then they just live in it. It's, it's, it's like dying without stopping breathing. I was, I was with someone, not, not someone on the path once, and I was trying to help him come to a greater understanding. And I mean, I'm so dumb. I said, don't you want to grow? And he looked at me with horror. He said, no, just like that. And he was an older man. He said, I've had a lot of suffering in my life. I don't want any more, which was actually an interesting answer. And then I realized, oh my gosh, what am I doing? You know, this is not... Who am I serving? And I remembered Swamiji's definition of true maturity, which he describes as the, uh, what do you say, the goal of all education, his education for life method. He, he, in his book, Education for Life, which is a wonderful book if you have a lot of time on your hands. Swami's written a hundred plus books. You can read them all now if you have time on your hands. I know a lot of you are just working from home, so it's not like you really have nothing to do. But in any case... Um, he said, before we know what, what education can and should be, we have to know what the goal is. So Swami described the goal of education is true maturity. And true maturity is the ability to relate to realities other than your own. Swami is such a master wordsmith. He can just, you know, just get one phrase and say it exactly. True maturity, and even the word maturity is a very interesting word. Like the goal of education is, is to, to bring people to a state of true maturity. I mean, nobody talks about that. The goal of education is to find a safe profession where you can get a job, where you can get lots of money. I mean, that's all that people are thinking about. That's why education is such a mess. But, uh, um, I mean, the, 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 the understanding of what it is. But true maturity... First is the goal, and then that's the ability to relate to realities other than your own. Now, Swami's trying to, to put it in a secular context. He doesn't want to say the goal of life is to realize God, because he was trying to write a book for a secular audience about what is essentially a secular subject, but still the same principles apply. So there I was with my friend, my older friend. 
I thought, I'm not relating to his reality at all. I'm just relating to my own. And of course, that's how we make mistakes. That's what ignorance is. Ignorance is to not truly perceive what is going on around us. You know, the most remarkable thing about Swamiji, um, well, one of the most remarkable, one of the notably remarkable things about Swamiji, was that he always understood what was going on around him. He understood the people. He, I mean, I'll use myself as an example, but I saw it in countless other situations. He, he knew me better than I knew myself. And I, I know I've mentioned this before, but I, I can't say it often enough with enough gratitude. He, he always understood me. And it was, a re- it was a remarkable experience to have someone in your life who always understood you. You know, there are many people in my life who like me, some who love me, some who even think I'm inspiring to listen to. <laughs> but not that that's necessary, but it's the truth. But Swami always understood me. He always knew what I intended. That's what I mean. People can understand each other's words, but even in Autobiography of the Yogi, Sri Yukteswar says, you know, strive to discern behind the confusion of men's verbiage what their actual intention is. I'm not quoting that exactly, but that's the meaning of it. There's a phrase like confusion of their verbiage, meaning we often use words not knowing the implications of those words. Even I, who am quite attentive to words, or I myself don't know what I feel. You know, it's of course that we're a mystery to ourselves, but none of us were a mystery to Swamiji because he was truly mature. He could relate to realities that weren't his own. He, could, he wouldn't make the kind of mistakes that I have often made where it seemed like a good idea at the time. I, there was a, when, because I'm speaking of this, I'll, I'll talk about a particular situation we were in. There was a group of us at the, at the table, and it was the table in uh, my, my home, not this house, but a different place where I lived. Ever since, ever since we came to live in Palo Alto in 1987, Swamiji has often been a guest in the home, and he would often come here with... It, it, for a while, it was sort of like this was like a... He would bring a number of the leaders from Ananda village and they would stay here for several days or even for a week. And it was kind of like a place where he could be with people he needed to talk to. In a, But they were away from their responsibilities and we would host and provide accommodations in the community and I would cook and we would sit around this big table that we have. We could, 16 people sometimes could sit at that table. And there was a large group of us there and Swamiji said to a person who whose name is not important, who actually is no longer with us, so it doesn't even matter. But Swami said, you should make an album of the Shakespeare songs that Swami had written. He said, because your voice is more suitable to those Shakespeare songs. When Swami, Swami's written a great deal of music, and at one point in his music writing career in the 60s, even late 60s, I think, he said the melodies came to him so easily but to, to get the words that were the right meaning, the right meter, the rhymes, all of that, he said it was a lot of work. And so t- sort of to take a break, he, he went to, the, to Shakespeare's plays and he pulled out some of the more beautiful songs there and he put those words to melodies because it was relaxing and easy for him to do. So he has, I don't know whether it's 15 or 20 or something like that, Shakespeare songs that he would often sing and others would sing. The meaning of most of them is not profound, and some of them are actually bawdy in, in Shakespeare's way of being bawdy, which is always very tasteful. You know, um, in delay there lies no... He, there's this song to this young maiden, and he says, in de, uh, present mirth has present laughter. In delay there lies no plenty. So come kiss me, sweet and twenty. And it's this, you know, man talking to a young girl trying to kiss her. But you know, body, I mean, today people are absolutely vulgar and they're totally pornographic. You know, uh, Shakespeare was very tastefully body. But nonetheless, you know, Swami sings those songs and he sings them quite happily. So, but Swami was telling this man that you know, he should make an album of the Shakespeare songs 
because they, they were more suitable to his voice, is how Swami put it. And I'm not sure quite what Swami was thinking. Maybe he was trying to give the man a project. I don't really know. Well, his friends, all of us at the table, picked it up from a different angle. We picked it up from the fact that those, some of those songs were a little bawdy and, you know, it was more appropriate for him to be singing bawdy songs than for Swami to be singing bawdy songs like that. And we were teasing and all of us had a nod to tease each other all the time, and Swami teases us, and it's, it's usually very sweet and it's very good-natured. But this went on as it does for a minute. You know, when there's eight people at the table, six of them have to speak because one of them says something witty, and then the other thinks of something wittier, and then someone tops that. So it rolls for a minute. So it's rolling. But I happened to look over at Swamiji, and Swami was just like this. And some of the witticisms were actually quite clever. I mean, it was just... But Swami was absolutely um, just completely impassive. He, he refused to participate. And I noticed and I realized that we were teasing too close to the... It was, it was laughter too close to the bone. It just... And, and, and Swami could feel that the man's feelings were being hurt. And, and he absolutely refused to participate. And then when, when all of it had died down, he just, again, very seriously said, you have a beautiful voice, and I think your, so- your voice would be very good for these songs. But whoa, was that ever a lesson? You know, the rest of us just didn't even notice it. But Swami could feel immediately. He could just feel the vibration of it, just that little bit of... And even the guy himself, he was participating. You know, he was participating because he didn't want to be a bad sport, but Swami understood him, and he really knew what was happening. And that, those, are, those are big lessons. When you see like that, da, that's what it is to be a real saint. Is that you, you, you always, everybody's reality is your reality. So, I mean, coming back to what Master's talking here about not calling ourselves sinners, you know, it hurts Divine Mother when we call ourselves sinners. It really does. Because just like when we were making fun of that man a little bit and his limitations, right? It, it hurt Swami because when that man was hurt, Swami was hurt. Because we are a part of all that is. We have our festival of light every week and you know, offer a prayer of gratitude to the infinite Christ that, that others may be blessed to receive even as you have received. For you are a part of all that is. We have that in the festival, we say it. For you are a part of all that is. Do we actually, how often do we actually really meditate on what the, what the implications of that are? There's a story about Sri Ramakrishna in uh, the cook in the ashram, the temple there. I guess there was a cat who used to come into the kitchen and the, the cook, who was, I guess, a bit of a um, hard-edged type, he didn't like the cat coming in the kitchen, and he, he chased it out by whacking it with a spoon. And then when he came to get the darshan of Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna was in terrible pain in his back. And this man was outraged. Somebody has hurt you. Who has hurt you? And Ramakrishna said, you. And the, you know, the cook was absolutely horrified because he would never have raised his hand to his guru like that. But Ramakrishna just said, when you struck the cat, you struck me. And not only was it like a Vedantic statement, but the welts actually appeared on Ramakrishna's back. And I, I mean, it, happens at a, it happened at a distance. Ramakrishna wasn't even watching. But you are, we are a part of all that is. I mean, think of that level of sensitivity. And then think how differently we would and do respond to each other when we're paying attention. But of course then, it requires of us also this level of purity and detachment. I mean, the reason Swamiji could be that way, the reason Master could be that way, is there was no ego. There was no self to protect. There was no need, personal need, that had to be fulfilled. So this is what we strive to become, because we have to wash all the mud off eventually because we are this pure gold. But it helps us to say, I am gold covered with mud, rather than I am mud. I've often, 
I had a, a bad habit of uh, blaming myself too hard, being too hard on myself. And I remember in some context I was lamenting something I'd done wrong. Swami said to me, when you concentrate, when, when all you do is throw dust on your own head, in an exaggerated way in this case, he said, all you're thinking about is dust in your own head. You know, you're not really moving towards spirit. You're just locking yourself in the, oh, how terrible I am. So you say, I said, Swami, Swami said, and it's true, if you do something wrong, you should have the courage to both admit it and to face it. But once you do, it's like, what did you expect? You know, if you're not a fully liberated master, if, if I am not a fully liberated master, which, surprise, surprise, I'm not, um, then things will happen because I'll get confused. And when I get confused and it, it's presented to me by life that an error has been made, it's very important to admit it. And it's very important to have the self-honesty to just look at it and learn what you can. But then all you say is, well, little mud, little mud to be washed off because I am pure gold. I am covered with mud. You see, that's the balance point. <laughs> or mud will splatter on me. But I am pure gold. It's a very important spiritual point. Okay, let's go on now to number 452. I once attended a service led by a famous woman evangelist. This is Master talking. During her sermon, she shouted, now, this is fun that Master was there. I mean, what kind? I once attended a service by a famous woman evangelist. Later on, uh, the next one is about Amy Semple McPherson, who was a very famous woman evangelist in Los Angeles, a contemporary of Master's. And so, because he was a major spiritual figure there, I'm sure he reached out or she reached out to him. She invited him. It would have been rude not to go. I mean, Master was a singleton. So it wasn't like he had other sadhus he could visit. There were none. He was in Los Angeles presenting this whole new spiritual reality and trying to reach people with it. So it would be only natural that he would reach out to other spiritual leaders. And Amy Semple McPherson was a, a, a huge phenomenon. She had I, probably thousands, but definitely many, many hundreds. And she was you know, quite a remarkable, uh, powerful spiritual force in Los Angeles. I've I must have read a book about her at some point. And anyway, it was a very interesting story. So I once attended a service led by a famous woman evangelist, either Amy Semple McPherson or someone else. During her sermon, she shouted, You are all sinners! Get down on your knees! Now, you know, this is a, a spiritual teaching of a way to express humility and to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. This is a certain uh, theological perspective that Master is resisting, I will add. So then Master says, I was the only one present who remained standing. <laughs> and if it was her, she has had a very big church. The Master ended with a smile. I would not admit that I was a sinner. Isn't that fun? Don't you just love that whole picture? You know, everybody in the church, she's ordered everyone on their knees, and they're all in these. He even says, remain standing. It wasn't even like they were sitting and went to their knees. They had to go to their knees and they look around and there's this, he wasn't very tall, Master, I think just five, five or six or something like that. But he undoubtedly was a very powerful figure. And even the fact that he was Indian, there weren't that many Indians in America at that time. So they're all on their knees being sinners. She's standing in the front and he's standing up. Now he's also talking to her. I mean, he's also communicating to her with this, whoever it was. You know, he's making a statement. And he wasn't afraid to make that statement. He didn't cooperate with whoever this evangelist was. He just wasn't going to admit it. Now, he doesn't tell us who she was, whether he talked to her later, what she thought about his stand, or anything like that. He just tells us that I wouldn't admit it, because I'm not a sinner. Now, of course, Master wasn't a sinner at all. He was a fully self-realized Master. But even identified as a human being, he, he wasn't going to affirm it. It's powerful and it's beautiful when you think about it. Now Swami writes, People sometimes offer the following challenge to those words of Master. But Jesus himself said that we are sinners. Yes. And St. Francis, this is Swami writing, Yes. 
and St. Francis and many other Christian saints have also called themselves sinners. Now, this is a very important point. So, so also, for that matter, sometimes did Yogananda when he wanted to emphasize his human littleness before God. So, Master wasn't always consistent, but he was consistent in his principles. Self-deprecation with the purpose of emphasizing the greatness of the infinite is altogether different from absorbing oneself in one's own imperfection. Now see, that's the whole point. When Francis said, I'm nothing, I'm a sinner, you know, I'm just evil and weak and ignorant, what he was actually saying is God is everything. And compared to the infinite, I'm just a little speck of dust. But Francis's identification was with the greatness of God, and it was really the ego self that he was repudiating with that. And so Master himself, when he called himself a sinner, would be speaking of human limitations, not his true nature. So self-deprecation with the purpose of emphasizing the greatness of the infinite is altogether different from absorbing oneself in one's own imperfection. This is me putting dust on my head and concentrating therefore only on dust in my own head. In the entire universe, all I could see was my own imperfections. To emphasize one's own sinfulness, however, is an excuse many people use for remaining imperfect. We should remember that Jesus himself said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Thus Yogananda often said, The greatest sin is to call oneself a sinner. It is a way of hypnotizing oneself with one's own weakness. Always affirm your strength in God, His strength through you. Wow, there's so much in there, isn't there? My goodness, these are wonderful. These little bits from Master that Swami saved for us. You know, there. Let me let me sort of see what I can think about there. Because the reality of it is, is we are weak. And we are small, and there are, there's so many times in life when one is just pushed to the limit and realize one just you can't do it anymore. You just like sadness is too much, grief is too much, fear is too much, and and those are real states that we come to. But the the way out of them is to realize it doesn't matter because that's not who I really am that the comforter is always there. I'm Divine Mother's child. The solution to all of that is to know that Mother will always take us in and that we, we, don't have to, we don't have to earn that love. That love is always ours. You know, all of the themes that I've been talking about even before we were talking about the book, it's all right here. Uh, because if we concentrate too much on our own perfections, imperfections, let me, let me sort of When I was in seclusion once, um, not a writing seclusion, but just a meditation seclusion, um, because we're supposed to love God, and because we're, when you meditate, you offer yourself to God. I mean, that's one of the ways, one one devotional practice is you, you lift your heart up to the spiritual eye and you offer yourself to God, or you visualize Master or whatever image of the divine inspires you and you offer yourself into it. It's lovely. You chant to God. These are all the wonderful things you have time to do when uh, you've lost your job and you're sheltered in place <laughs> or, or you're in seclusion or whatever happens or it's the Sabbath or whatever happens. But I remember when I was in that meditation practice, I was remembering to as many as received him, St. John said, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. And there's also a tremendous amount of teaching, not only about self-offering, but about receptivity. I myself have often shared with you in different contexts the prayer that I, I've come to when someone is suffering, but there's nothing that I can do to alleviate their suffering. The prayer that I often pray, have come to, is, Divine Mother, whatever it is you're trying to teach them, 
because I know that suffering would not be imposed upon them unless Divine Mother had a reason. Whatever it is you're trying to teach them, give them the humility, the wisdom, the devotion, and the receptivity to learn it. Because without that receptivity, it doesn't matter. We'll just never learn it. Because we, we have to be open to this. I'm, I'm going to hold my place here because I remembered something funny that I was talking to a friend of mine about. Uh, at some time, at some point, I saw some little television clip. And the television clip was, this was many years ago. The television clip was that some filmmaker decided he was going to decide once and for all whether the mind actually influenced the body, whether we got certain diseases because of our mental attitudes. And so the way he was going to do it is he was going to interview a lot of people and ask them. <laughs> this is the American way. So when he says, truth is just voted in and out of fashion, he said that's why people are gradually losing respect for truth because it's just voted in and out of fashion. So, so this cameraman takes his camera into a hospital room, and there's a woman there, and she's being treated for cancer. And he asked, the, the interviewer asked this woman whether or not uh, she thinks that, you know, some mental attitude on her part helped create the cancer, that there's actually a connection between the illness in her body and her state of mind. And this woman says, hell no! Bad enough that I have cancer. I'm not going to be responsible for it, too. <laughs> I just loved it. Everything about it was so magnificent. The absurdity of the filmmaker, the question, the woman's absolute response. I thought of that because she was not receptive to that point of view. <laughs> it didn't matter. No evidence would have persuaded her. No amount of suffering was going to persuade her. She was not receptive. So she was not going to learn it. And with us, if we're not receptive, we're not going to learn it. We can just be beaten up by life over and over again, but we will not learn it until we are receptive to the lesson, until it's up. I remember uh, someone was trying to persuade someone of a certain, the need to reform themselves in a certain way, and somehow Swami got into the middle of the story. And, and the person said that the person was insisting, said to Swami, well, wouldn't he be better off if he did change in this way? And Swami agreed. Oh, yeah, actually, yes, it would be quite good for him. He said, but he has to be ready to hear it. He has to be receptive. Truth doesn't mean anything until it makes sense to you. It's just as simple as that. Think about it. There's a point in our lives when all of a sudden we're ready. We're ready to learn this lesson. Until then, it could be told to you a thousand times. You don't even hear it. It's like somebody speaks the truth to you and it just blah, 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 blah. You just, I mean, sometimes you literally fall asleep. You just don't, don't hear it. So coming back to receptivity. So here I am in seclusion. And I'm, you know, doing what I do. And it just occurred to me, oh, maybe I should try to receive God's love. Not that the thought had never occurred to me. But it just in the context, in, the, in that marvelous receptivity that you can get into when you're solitary for a long period of time. And I, I thought, you know, I tried to, to open my heart to receive Divine Mother's love. And wow, was that interesting. I became, I became really aware Think how to say, yeah, I can think how to say this. It's like Divine Mother's love is a particular, extremely refined vibration of consciousness. And, you know, everything is vibration in, on, in this world. And attunement with God is when we align our vibration with the divine vibration. And lack of attunement is when we've aligned ourselves with other realities. And every, every reality has its own wavelength, so to speak. And when the wavelengths are the same, they blend. But when the wavelengths are different, you know, they can't, they can't reach each other. They either bang against each other or they just remain separate. I mean, that's why I can sit in this chair and not fall through it, even though it's all energy, and not just fall through the floor and then fall through the earth. It's because this is, we're all vibrating at different uh, levels. I mean, this is my exceedingly simplistic and probably scientifically unsound method, but it vi I can visualize it. 
So I'm here like this. I have my arms spread out. I wasn't really like so dramatic, but that was like trying to say it. I'm meditating. I was actually meditating as I always do. But I was trying to be like this. And I could feel that Divine Mother's love was all around me. There was no missing the fact that she was listening and she was present. But my heart was vibrating uh, with all my self-preoccupations, primarily um, unresolved angers, unresolved hurts, unresolved desire for revenge, (laughs) conversations that I wished I'd been clever enough to think of at the time so I could have really told so-and-so what I really thought. But just all of these self-definitions, most of which were negative, um, or I wasn't thinking, mostly for me, it was, it was uh, hurts and angers. It wasn't so much that I wasn't worthy. Um, I, that wasn't what crossed my mind. It was, more, it was different than that. It was just that I was very busy being preoccupied with the things in this world that weren't right for me. So it wasn't exactly I'm calling myself a sinner, but what I felt was as long as I hold on to these lower vibrations, Divine Mother will be right there with me, but I won't be able to receive her. Because she's not a, she's not a physical thing. She's not like a fruit that I can eat. She's a vibration of consciousness that I need to meld with. And I can't meld with it because I'm too busy doing this. Just, just like that. I'm too busy vibrating like this because of all my unresolved uh, annoyances with the universe. Now, easily, just as easily, I didn't happen to feel it at that time, but of course I feel it at other times because I'm not worthy, because I'm not good enough, because I made too many mistakes, because I'm ashamed, because I don't want Divine Mother to know, because I'm a sinner because I'm fundamentally a sinner. And therefore that makes me, you know, in my fundamental nature, different than God. And this is what Master came to tell us is not true. You're a child of God. What is, his, what is yours belongs, what is his belongs to you. And this is what Jesus really tried to say with the father, the, pro, the story of the prodigal son. Even though the prodigal son goes off and wastes the whole, you know, dis, uh, just dissipates himself and loses the entire inheritance. But when he comes back, the father loves him and he celebrates his return. He doesn't point a finger and say, well, you, were, you behaved so badly, get away from my gate. He said, my son was lost and now he has returned to me. I mean, that, that, that's a tremendous story. So there's nothing we can do. The, the phrase is unconditional love. That's, that's really, these are, these are such beautiful ideas to meditate upon. Unconditional love. God loves us unconditionally. That means there's absolutely nothing we can do that can even, even in the slightest way even diminish or affect with a speck of dust. It's unconditional. It, it, it's ours because that's who we are. We, are. we are God's child. And if we advance all the way, we are one with God. We are as much divine as everything. In uh, the Festival of Light, we say you know, that God's love is equal, not just for Jesus Christ and Krishna and great saints everywhere, but... He loves even the ones who have sinned the most greatly. I've had that. It, it's like all of us are progressing toward the divine and all of us are just going through, you know, we have to just go tunnel through the mud. And, and it's a very interesting to, thing to contemplate. God loves even those who have sinned most greatly. So you think of people who are really behaving badly. But Divine Mother is loving them just the same and just helping them through their particular mud, just like she's helping us through our particular mud, because the love is unconditional. So no bad thing that we do uh, disqualifies us, and the good things that we do don't really earn her approval, but the good things that we do 
change our vibration to be closer to hers. So then we feel her presence more because we're not doing stuff that keeps us distant from her. You see? And we're washing off the mud when we begin to realize, oh, I am a part of all that is. Oh, I have to take other people's realities into account as well as my own. We feel God's, what you might call their, his approval, or however you want to feel it. But it's not that God is approving us more. It's that we're getting more in tune with the vibration that's always there, so we're able to receive more of it. You see the difference? And that's why we have to work so hard to be good. <laughs> not to earn it, but because then we'll be able to experience it because we wash off the mud and we see a little more of the light. You can think about it, whatever image you want to use. I like, I like attunement. Attunement works for me because, I don't know, because I like music. And even though, as I, I say, I'm a mediocre singer, I understand how it works. I feel it. I feel it in myself. I can feel when the notes are just right. And I, I know how everything just comes together. So I know how it feels when when... My, myself when I'm vibrating in the correct way. And what causes me to vibrate in the correct way is to not do really stupid things, <laughs> which is not to sin, not to act out of ignorance or selfishness or, or lack of maturity. You know, to, to not realize the consequences of my own actions, the vibrations of where they come from. And everything matters that's the thing about it, you see, everything matters. That's the good news, actually, because we don't have to wait for great moments to do great things. Sometimes the greatest moments are the tiniest ones, the really little tiny moments when we really actually get it right. And sometimes it's just nowhere. I, once when, when I was in seclusion, um, my writing seclusion, which was now a couple of years ago, and I was at a friend's house, and she had a land with uh, a little pond on it. Was it spring? It was summer. It must have been, let me just think for a minute. It was early spring. That's when it was. There were a lot of creatures there, because it was a rural area. There were wild turkeys. There were geese. There were um, just pigeons and birds and just lots of, of stuff. There was a fox sometimes. And because I was just so by myself, all of those creatures began to become my community is the only way I can think about it. And, and there was such a feeling of, of, of being one with all that is. And I'm not a person, as a, as a general rule, I don't have pets. I'm not, I'm not drawn to animals. I don't make friends with every dog I meet. I'm just animals... Um, I like more intellectual content as a rule. <laughs> so it just, I'm not a person, it's not that I don't like them, but it's not, my, it's not my nature. But during that time with the wild geese coming and going and the turkeys, and at some point in that time, the turkeys hatched. And for a couple of days, there were these 10, yeah, there were 10 little tiny turkeys following their turkey mother. Maybe their turkey father was around too. Now, every mother loves her children, but little tiny turkeys are even uglier than great big turkeys. <laughs> and I really looked at them. We had a lot of conversations about how fortunate they were to be born to someone who looked like them because their mother probably thought they were beautiful. Every mother thinks their child is beautiful. But we all became friends, or at least I became their friends. You know, nothing was happening. I wasn't in front of a lot of people giving a big talk. I wasn't telling them about my years with Swamiji. You know, nothing. And they weren't interested in uh, my Vedanta at all. They were just little turkeys doing their thing. But we were all on the same wavelength. And the whole universe was coming through. I really understood which I understand anyway, but I really felt the American Indian spirituality. You know, the American Indian spirituality 
Swamiji made an interesting remark, has made interesting remarks. He says, it appears to be gone, but it isn't. He said, it's, it's in the soil of America and, and it's influencing all of us and it will rise again. And I, I've often felt it, but I really felt it there. Well, this is how the American Indians lived. They lived really close to the, to the you know, they didn't have big, heavy buildings. They lived right in that vibration, and that's why everything talked to them. Everything talked to them. I, I'm just going to tell this little tiny bit about American Indians because we're almost finished here. I read this book about Crazy Horse, I think it was. It was a wonderful book, but it was so heartbreaking I could never read it again. And, uh, but they were, he, it, was, it was the cycle of when the American Indians just com- were com- being completely obliterated by the white man. Master actually said that America has, was going to have to go through a serious economic collapse because of the bad karma of what we did to the American Indians, because we got our wealth by destroying them. So we're going to have to lose our wealth for a time as a country. This is national karma. And those of us who, who have taken the benefit are going to have to experience this. As a country, it's karma we have to pay off. And once that's paid off, he said, America's karma is very, very good. All of America's karma is good, but we're going to have to go through this dip. So when the American Indians were being completely obliterated and and their way of life was being destroyed, and it was either Crazy Horse or one of the other chiefs, just had to accept that they just had to go to the reservation. And then he talked about how they... They, they, because there were no more buffalo, they had always built their teepees out of buffalo skin. But now the buffalo were gone, so there was just no way they could live. So they go live by the reservation, and the American government provides them with canvas to make their teepees. And as far as the American government is confern, con- concerned, canvas teepee, why not? You know, it's easier than having to go out and shoot a buffalo. And the Indian says, just like this, he said, in the winter storms... The buffalo skin teepees were heavy, and no matter how much the wind blew, they were completely silent. He said the canvas just roars in the wind. And the the Indian chief talked about, but to save the remnant of his people, he would live in the noisy teepee all through the winter months. And I just thought about that. Who among us would even know? You know, we wouldn't even know because we weren't living in that extraordinarily sensitive relationship, you know, to the world around them. So they had nothing but an animal skin between them and the whole world around them. They were just right there. Now, that's divine, because that is, the creation is divine mother. That's attunement. We don't have to become American Indians, but we have to become attuned by whatever method is given to us. That's who we're meant to be. That's washing off all the mud and letting the gold shine. God bless you.